And I think, if I'm not mistaken, to today is the 16th of December. Am I right? So, how many has been enjoying what we've been doing in this service? Amen. Well, we've been studying Daniel 9 and 24. We've been a long time on that one verse of Scripture. So let's read it again today. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now, in our study, we've covered all of those down to this part of anointing the most holy. And I think it tied in so appropriate that last Sunday we could anoint this building. Because that's right where we were dealing with was Moses and them over in Leviticus chapter 8, how they anointed that tabernacle that they built. And I believe things ought to be dedicated to the Lord. And a building and so forth. No matter what may have happened in a building, you know, like if you go so many times years ago, I used to hold revivals and I'd go rent an armory or go rent an auditorium somewhere. And a lot of times before the crowd would ever gather, I'd go in there and go all over the place praying and commanding every demon and devil to get out of there. Because you see, there's... Uh, there's spirits, and that's what folks don't realize. In this life, there are lots of spirits, demon spirits, evil spirits. And those spirits hang around certain places. Now, we know that things like rock and roll music, that attracts evil spirits. And all of those folks that are singing rock and roll or rap music or whatever, there's a spirit associated with that that gets on the singer and it also gets on those that listen. That's why we're against that sort of music. Quiet now. Not one amen, I notice. But anyway, it's so anyhow. Somebody said, well, I don't believe it matters, you know. Just to, I believe if I just know the truth and I go down there and I hear Brother Jim preach the truth, I believe I can do anything I want to do because I know the truth. That just shows it really hadn't come as a revelation to you yet. You might you see the Bible said that if you understood all the mysteries and you still didn't have this charity, he said you're nothing, just a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal and all. You've read that little portion of Scripture. So it's something that you have to apply. We're going to get into that today. And sometimes I wonder if in this church, if all of us have applied the token, or that's another term for the Holy Ghost. And uh, anyway, there are spirits that hang around things. And some folks think they're going to make it, but they've got a spirit on them that causes them to be a certain way. Some folks get an old fussy spirit on them. Some get an old gossipy spirit on them. I went in a store yesterday, and uh, I knew the owner of the store. He owned a radio station that I used to be on. Very nice man, a preacher as a matter of fact. And, and while we were talking, he said to me, he said, I own that station, but said, I did not know until this week that you wasn't on there anymore. He said, I thought you was on my station, and I found out that you weren't. He said, I'm sorry. He said, it's not me. He said, there's a man out there running that station and said, he don't like you. Well, I didn't have no idea who it was. He called his name. I said, well, excuse me, but I've never heard of him. He don't like me. I said, I wouldn't know him if I met him. And as far as I know, he wouldn't know me. <clears throat> but uh, anyhow, he didn't like me. So he took me off. Quiet in here now. You know, but spirits get on people. I said, well, what's his problem? Why don't he like me? He said, well... Said, I don't think it's just you. Said, he don't like nobody. Said, he's jealous of everybody. That starts making more sense. So what is it? In fact, the fellow told me, he said, everybody working at that station 
said none of them like him either because of his bad attitude and bad spirit. But he said, it's all right. Said, said, I've sold the place and said the end of December, said the new owners are taking over and he's going to be out of a job. And he said, I'm going to have that station off my hands. So here's a man that I've never met. But somehow he decided that he didn't like me. He don't know one thing about me, never met me, never seen me, don't know where I live, don't know nothing. But what is it? Jealousy. Now, did you know that it's a spirit that causes jealousy? So some folks get that kind of a spirit on them. And uh, as a result, they're just jealous all the time. I've seen marriages break up because one would be jealous over another. Just read in the paper today, there was a woman somewhere that thought her husband was running around. Now, how many times I heard that? Of course, sometimes it's true, but it's not always true. Sometimes there's people that think that uh, the husband's running around or the wife running around, and they're not guilty at all. It's just that person's about half nuts, you know. They got that spirit of jealousy on them, and it's eat on them so bad, it wouldn't matter who they was married to. It wouldn't matter if they sat 24 hours a day looking at one another, and the woman knew the man never went nowhere else, She'd still think the worst of him. Yeah, you might be sitting there looking at me, but I don't know where your mind's at. You probably got your mind on some other woman. So you can't win with some people. So this woman had this attitude that her husband was running around. And she got out driving around with her sister or somebody, and they passed the driveway not too far from their house, and there said a car just like his car. She went up and broke the door down, broke in on some people, and they shot her and killed her. And it turned out it wasn't even her husband's car. It was just one that looked like it. And he wasn't in there at all, and she died. Why did she die? Because a spirit of jealousy had made her insane. Now, ain't nobody worth that, honey. I'm going to tell you now. I always tell me, and man come to me not long ago, boo-hooing and crying around. and You know, people got this big idea of what love is. He was in love with her. Nobody but her. Didn't want nobody. Don't want to live if I can't have her. I said, women are like a bus stop. There's one on every corner. If that one mistreats you, I said, there'd be one down the road that'll treat you better. Got quiet in here now. Some folks don't like this kind of preaching. <laughs> but anyhow, some folks are all hung up on love. I see some women, men as well, they get to dating some old drunk somewhere and uh, so hung up on that sorry rascal and he wouldn't do, uh, if you married him, he wouldn't provide, he wouldn't pay. You'd have to work and pay the rent and buy the food and, and buy his liquor too. And while you was off working, he would be running around with some other woman. Quiet now, but preach on, Brother Jim. You know I'm telling you the truth. <clears throat> so I see it happen. But I love him. You know what's the truth of the matter? You don't have too good of opinion of yourself. Really, the truth of the matter, you're sitting there saying, well, I, I don't believe I could get another man if I lost him. You just don't think much of yourself. I'm not just preaching to you in here. There's folks listening on the radio right now. I'm not just preaching to y'all in here. There's folks in other countries that probably get this tape before this is over with. So maybe this will go in somebody's living room and tell the truth to them. But this woman had the spirit of jealousy and she went breaking in a house just because a car in the driveway was the same make and color as her husband's car and what would you do if somebody come breaking in your house in the midnight hour, tearing the door down? You'd do just what I'd do. If anybody wants to come up to Raleigh and break in my house, I'm going to say, come right on. I got a shotgun waiting on you. You let one of them dope heads come in and he's going home to see Jesus. I'm going to tell you now. Come on. <laughs> Y'all smile. I ain't playing no games. I won't just promise it to you. I was getting my hair cut the other day, and, and this, uh, the barber was talking about a little problem that he'd had in his neighborhood. Said they had some guy over there that 
cussed his wife out, cussed his son out, and was always threatening them, never did say nothing to him. And so it went on, and he tried to keep peace. He never did say nothing. So one day his wife called just screaming and crying. This guy threatened him and all this. And so he decided he was going over and kill this man. That's what he told me. So he got to thinking about it as he was driving the car, and he thought, no, there's no point in me going over to jail over this nut. So he said he stopped to call him. He got him on the phone, and he said, I'm telling you now, he said, I'm coming down to my house, and I'm going to get my gun, and said, if you've got any praying to do, you better do it before I get there, because I'm going to send you home to meet Jesus. He said, are you threatening me? He said, no, this is not a threat. This is a promise. <clears throat> he, so the fellow said to in other words, he got to telling this barber, he said, well, I thought you was henpecked. I kind of thought your wife was running things. He said, you are talking to the main man now. And I want you to know I'm running my household, and I'm going to take care of it. He said, I'll let you slide this one more time, but said, if you ever look at my wife, if you ever speak to her, if you ever speak to my son, he said, I'm sending you home to see Jesus. And that's not a threat, that's a promise. <laughs> So a little bit later on, he saw this same fellow uh, beating up on his little child and run his wife off, beating up on her. And then the next thing you know, they, the sheriff and them come and got him and sent him to the hospital somewhere for cuckoo cases, you know. But said he's acted all right ever since, that he don't bother them none. Hello? So... <clears throat> Anyhow, there's a spirit that causes, somebody said, now you ought not to act like that. Somebody said, you know, you ought to let the Lord fight your battles. If they're going to break in on you, listen, the Lord will fight my battles. Some of you sit around now and expect him to fight all your battles. You don't fight none. There's a few of mine I'm going to fight. He's going to have to stand. He may get you, but he's going to have to get in line behind me because I'm going to get you first if you do the wrong thing. You know, some folks got the idea that a Christian ought to be a doormat for everybody to walk on. Amen. Honey, now I've got a spirit of meekness. Yes, sir. But some folks don't know what meekness is. Listen, we've let the devil's crowd take over in this world today. And people are so scared to death. You know, and, and, and you, you know, just like here not long ago, I got on the radio, got to preaching on homosexuals, and somebody at the radio station got scared of that. They're so afraid of some little limp-wristed faggot somewhere. They don't want you to cry out against sin. Amen. I'm going to tell it like it is. You can hang up on me now. So I'm not a doormat. I'm going to stand against evil. My Bible said in Hebrew, said the word of God is sharp and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts us going and coming, you see. But the thing about a sword is this. You can have the world's sharpest sword and you could have it in the hand of a little 10-year-old child and he's not going to do very much cutting with it because he's not very strong. And that's just, see, it's a type of preaching the gospel. Now the gospel, the word of God is sharp and powerful, but God has to put it in a strong hand. Somebody that will not back down and kowtow to the devil and the devil's crowd we got preachers everywhere today that's so afraid they're going to offend somebody. Listen, I didn't come to Rocky Mount to win a popularity contest. I'm not here to win friends and influence people. I'm here to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I really, listen, I'm doing what God called me to do, and I'm not trying to get everybody in this. I don't want everybody down here. There's a lot of folks I don't want to come to this church. Oh. But well, somebody was telling me about a church that closed up in Rocky Mount not long ago. 
and said, Lord, said, <laughs> I guess they thought I was out for the money or something. They said, there's this woman that goes over there and said, Lord, said she gives big money. Said she'd give $20 or $50 or $100. Said she gives big offerings. And they was trying to suggest that I ought to go visit this woman to get her to come in over here. But then they went on. They said, you know, she is, she does cause a little bit of trouble and she, she, keeps a lot of backbiting and all. I said, I don't want her. I don't care if she give $10,000 a week. Amen. I don't need no troublemakers in here. I don't want somebody sowing seeds of discord and division. My Bible said, give no place to the devil. So I don't have time for all these jealous spirits and fighting, fussing, backbiting, arguing spirits. I don't have time for all of that. I, I'm not trying to win everybody to Jesus Christ because some folks is going to hell in spite of all I can do, all you can do, or anybody else. Now, God's not willing that any should perish, but all would have everlasting life. But honey, I got news for you. He came to seek and to save his own. The devil's crowd's not going to be saved. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm saying there are some elected people. My Bible said in Ephesians that some were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. And if you were chosen in Him, He wrote your name on the book before the foundation of the world. And then as a result, that's why I'm here preaching to try to find those chosen people, those that God loved. See, God... Said one time there was a woman expecting. And she was going to give birth to twins. And neither one of them ever been born. But he said, Jacob have a loved and Esau have a hated. And then one old devil come along. Well, I don't really believe he meant hate. I believe it meant he loved him less. Oh. Who are you to try to say what God thought? I'm going to tell you there's some that God loved and some that God foreknew and those that he foreknew he predestinated and those are the ones I'm trying to reach and I don't even want the rest. Some folks want to argue and fuss over the scripture. Apostle Paul got into that one time. He said if any man seems contentious we have no such customs in the church of God. What was Paul saying? He was saying, I am God's prophet and God has given me this revelation. He was saying, I went down in Arabia for three years and I met Jesus down there and he gave me the revelation of the word and I'm going to stand here and tell you what God said and that's exactly how it is. We're not going to argue over the word of God. But everybody got their idea of it today. Well, I believe it means this. Who cares what you believe? I'm talking to the radio audience now, not you folks in here. It don't matter what you think. You see, the point of it is, is this. This word came as God moved on and anointed prophets to speak it. And then here in this book of Daniel, part of it was the fact that it got sealed up. It was to be sealed until the end time. So if it took a prophet to bring it originally, then it would have to take another prophet to come as soon as God unsealed it. It would take a prophet to tell the people what God was doing. It always did work that way. Why well, one time, you see the problem in this church age today, everybody thinks they're a preacher. Everybody thinks God's talking to them. Everybody thinks they heard from God every day. And we've raised a bunch of Pentecostal lunatics up. Excuse me, I don't mean to be so hard, but I'm going to tell it like it is. Everybody running around, God showed me this, God showed me that. Everybody's seeing a blue light and a green light and a red light and angels fluttering with wings. That's the way it's going today. God never did do it that way. God came down one time. There was two or three million people gathered up. God had a prophet. Just remember, God always sends a leader. God had a prophet, and his name was Moses. 
God called Moses up onto the mountain and he went up there alone and got something from God. What did he get? The word of God. He came back with ten commandments written in tablets of stone. And that prophet went up there and got it from God and then the prophet came down and gave it to the people. Why didn't God just come down in, in, in view of everybody and write it out on the stone? Because when they gathered up around that mountain, something began to happen. The Bible talked how about, how about how there was smoke. The Bible talked about how a trumpet started sounding and they didn't even see a trumpet. And there was thunder and lightning. And the people got afraid because they knew that God was getting ready to do something. And they all screamed out in unison and said, Let Moses speak and not God, lest we die. And ever since that hour, when God got ready to do something, he'd always call a prophet aside and tell it to that prophet. And then the prophet would come down and tell the people. And when that prophet come down off the mountain, he'd been with God. He'd been in that Shekinah glory of the Lord. That cloud by day, that fire by night, he'd been in that Shekinah glory. And his face was shining so bright, it was hard for the people to look upon him. And he had to put up a veil upon his face. Mm, it's liable to get good in here. That's the way God moved. When God got ready to write the book of Revelation, he didn't come down and just start speaking to everybody, but he got one man out on an aisle called Patmos. His name was John. And he told John, and John wrote it down and gave it to the people. But here we are today in a book that's been sealed up, but God said the vision and the prophecy of the Bible would be sealed until the end time. And now listen, when God opens it, how's he going to tell the people what's in there? He'll raise up another prophet just like he raised up a Moses, a Jeremiah, an Isaiah, Elijah, or whoever. He'll send a prophet that's thoroughly proven and vindicated of the Lord and that prophet will tell the people what was in the book. But everybody thinks they're a preacher today. Confused. The Bible said if the blind lead the blind, they both fall in the ditch. Can't you just picture two blind folks trying to help one another down the street? <laughs> no telling what they trip over. I saw one the other day trying to go to college. And he was going down the street, and he was having a terrible time getting down the street. Maybe school had just started. Maybe it was his first year, and, and he had a stick, and this, that, and the other. And boy, he was going slow, and he was checking on every side and in front, and can't you see him trying to help some old lady across the street? They all liable to get hit by a car. Amen. But you see, God's always raised up some people. Somebody said, I thought you was preaching on this marriage and this honeymoon. Why, I am. You didn't know that? I just got down to start laying something down about it. You see... Think about a marriage for a moment. What, what's our custom here in this country? Well, each marriage might be a little bit different, but basically it boils down to this. There'll be a ceremony maybe. Now, now sometimes, you know, it's just kind of a private thing. Not a lot of people or something. Hello? You know, I never did... It's up to you, everybody do what you want to do, but I, I, I just never am hung up on all these big weddings. I'm just not going to spend that kind of money for some wedding. How many folks, one woman I knew jumped out and spent over $10,000 not long ago for a wedding that already is divorced. A bunch of freeloaders sitting around eating some fried chicken and hush puppies or something, you know, that I'm buying. No, I'll buy me some furniture and put in my house first. Now, that's just my opinion. When I got married, <clears throat> just a very small private thing, not a bunch of folks. And we went out and we spent our money getting us a T-bone steak or whatever it was. Don't even remember now. But uh, wasn't worried about feeding everybody else. Let them go home and feed themselves. 
But some folks do that. Now, that's the big ceremony. So what do they have? Well, now, if they have a church wedding, a lot of times everybody can come to the church. They may be 500 people come there. But then there is a reception usually afterwards. I wasn't all hung up on that. I was too busy. Didn't have the money no how. Got married with $80 in my pocket. That's all the money I had. So I sure wasn't going to buy y'all no fried chicken dinner. I couldn't have gone to Kentucky Fried, you know. But anyhow, some folks spend that kind of money. So what happens? They'll have a wedding, you know, at the church, and just about anybody that wants to come can come to that wedding. But then we have a reception, let's say. I've been to a few of those. What happens? You have to be invited to a reception. You just don't go strolling in there and get you some potato salad and fried chicken unless somebody invited you. Now, we're talking about a wedding here. Somebody said, well, you were talking about a prophet. And, uh, yeah, the, mm -hmm. You got to get the invitation. That's where we're at. I, was, I wasn't just slapping my gums up here a minute ago. I was telling you something for a reason. Now, last Sunday in this church service, we were talking to you about how one of these days there's coming an hour when there's going to be a rapture of the bride. And the bride is going to be taken up to heaven and over there we're going to have the wedding supper. Now, how do you get invited to this? What, what's this all about? The Bible tells about it in Matthew, the 25th chapter. It said, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now, you know what I feel? We're talking ten virgins. You know, I believe that all ten of these people thought they were going to make the rapture. That's what this is talking about. They really thought they were the bride of Christ. How many folks do you see today running around with bumper stickers on their car or their truck that's saying in case of the rapture, this car won't have a driver? I doubt it. A lot of people think that they're going and they're not going. Why? A lot of people think they have the Holy Ghost and they don't have the Holy Ghost. Now, they may have a manifestation of some of the gifts of the Spirit, but they really have never been filled with the Holy Ghost. Oh, but, but, but brother, I spoke with tongues. That don't mean nothing. I have preached for, I don't know, 30-some years, and I've seen demons and devils talk in tongues. I've seen witchcraft workers talk in tongues. I've seen Madam What's-Her-Name talk in tongues. That don't mean that you got anything. Tongues is a gift of God. It is one of the nine gifts of the Spirit. But the Scripture said, do all speak with tongues. How many times have I seen women come to church and speak in tongues? Somebody said that's a sign of the Holy Ghost. And they'd be standing there, especially in East See, folks today don't know how to respect the house of God. Now, this may not look like much over here yet. We've only been here a month, and we're in the process of remodeling. But nevertheless, excuse the naked two-befores, excuse the lumber, excuse things that are kind of piled up. We had to move from our other location over here in a hurry. But what I'm saying, this is is the house of God and some folks don't know how to respect the house of God. And how are they going to know unless the preacher tells them? So how many women go to church today wearing a pair of pants to the house of God? It's a total lack of respect for the house of Almighty God. Can't you just see some woman now wearing her pedal pushers up before the judgment bar of God when God said that a woman should not wear any kind of clothing pertaining to a man? 
But to do it and go to church and do it and not only go to church but have the gall and the audacity to stand up and talk in tongues and prophesy wearing a pair of pants. Honey, you've never been saved. You've never been sanctified. You've never been converted. You've never been filled with the Holy Ghost. Say amen now. Hallelujah. Same women sometimes come in there and I look today. And they'll cut their hair. And then go to church and go to prophesy. Don't you know if you women cut your hair, you'll be guilty of committing adultery on the day of judgment. In the Bible, any woman that cut her hair was considered a prostitute. Preach on, preacher. Amen. It was a... In fact, in those days, if they caught somebody like that, they shaved them bald-headed. So the Bible said, if you're going to cut it, just go ahead and shave it bald-headed. That shows what you are to God. But how many women, and today they say, oh, this long hair, it's too much trouble to deal with. And I see women that look like men. Don't you know I said there's a spirit that gets on people that causes them to do that? There's a spirit that gets on a woman that would cause her to want to cut her hair. And it ain't one of God's spirits either that gets on you. But they'll stand and claim to have the Holy Ghost when the Word of God condemns this. Then some of them get down in their church and they'll drag a table out and they'll say, all right, you men, come and and put your dues on the table. You women of the church, come and put your dues on the table. You're going to hell for disobeying God. The Bible don't say nothing about paying no dues. My Bible said to bring the tithes and the offerings into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. And some of these preachers that some of you are listening to are going to send your soul to hell. They're going to tell you to come and bring that dollar or that two dollars a week when God said the tithe, the ten percent belongs to Him. And not only the tithe, but some offerings in addition to the tithe because the tithe is God's anyhow. That ten percent ain't even yours. It belongs to God. Hmm. Lord, it's quiet in here today. People will listen to a preacher. Well, we've always done it that way at our church. Well, you've always been wrong, ain't you? Amen. I'm telling you how it really is. Somebody's afraid to mention money. I'm not, because the Bible talks about it. The Bible speaks about giving 10% to God. And if you don't do it, the Bible said, will a man rob God? You bring them dues down there and you don't pay your tithes, you've robbed God. I don't care if you left $2 or $5 on the table, you've robbed God. Let me get off of that. But you see what I'm saying? Today, people will disobey the word of God, this Bible, and they still think they're going. Now, so we got down near the time of the rapture and here's a group of people that have the oil in their vessel, the Holy Ghost, and they get up and trim their lamps and all these other folks get up and get trimmed up too. They say Jesus is getting ready to come. That's the way they're preaching today. And they all go out to meet the Lord and you couldn't tell some of them they didn't have it. They all went out there to meet Him. They got ready for the rapture. Now you see what it is? They had to be deceived. They thought they were all right. They thought they were ready. Oh, they'll stand you down when Jesus comes. I'm going back with Him. Oh, I hear them singing gospel songs all the time. Some of my friends, I heard them singing one the other day about the cloud I'm going back on or something. They sing all kinds of songs about the rapture and how we're going with Him when He comes. So they really think they're going to make it. But let's watch this thing. Some of them didn't make it. The Bible said the wise made it. But the foolish didn't make it. And the foolish come up there in a little bit. Lord, open up. 
They missed it. Why did the wise make it? Because, listen to this, God sent a prophet and the prophet gave an invitation to the marriage supper and the wise believed the word and accepted it and the foolish said, I, you know, I, uh, 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 we don't need no prophet. What we need is a new bishop here in our denomination. We, we need to have a new election. That's what we need. All that business of denominations ain't nothing but religious politics and it's as stinking and filthy and as rotten as the politics in this government. Not to preach politics, but I like what one man said not long ago. I went in a little place to buy a newspaper the other day and this guy, I don't know why he got talking to me. He said, boy, now we're giving money to Russia. A billion dollars. We got folks over here starving, but we're going to help them. That shows you the stupidity of the leaders of our government. We got to help everybody around the world. I looked at that man, I said, if they'd let me in to run things for a little while, I'd get all this straightened out, and I guarantee you, we'd have some money, we'd pay our bills, and we'd feed our people. I said, now the rest of the world might be mad at me, but I'd let them figure it out for themselves. If I was in as the leader... They wouldn't be giving money to all these artists to paint art pictures and hello? I'm telling you, I'd cut it to the bone. They go down there to Pentagon and buy hammers and spend eight hundred dollars. I'd send them down to the Kmart if they needed the hammer. Quiet in here, but I'm gonna tell it like it is. I said we got a bunch of nuts in Washington, but the thing I was getting to, I heard one man the other day said, What we need to do. And I'll tell you, I'm going down and I'm going to register and this is exactly what I'm going to do the next time. If God don't change my mind, I'm going to find out who's in and I'm going to vote against everybody that's already been in. I'm going to vote for somebody that ain't never been in. I said, let's clean house and put somebody that ain't never been in in. <clears throat> didn't mean to get onto that. That didn't cost you a dime. but we got a bunch of nuts trying to run things. And they ain't going to change nothing. You know why they ain't going to change it? It don't matter who the president is. It don't matter who the congressman is. They got all these bureaucrats in Washington running all these departments. They don't get elected. They, they in the, what, what is that civil service? You, you took that one time and worked up there. Isn't that what you pass? Pass civil service. And you get in there for life and, and you keep getting promoted, and, and those people, listen, they run them departments like they always have. It don't matter if the Democrats is in, the Republicans in, whoever in, they're going to do what they've always done. That's what the problem is. A whole lot of things they do in this country. We'd have a recession if I got in, but it wouldn't be a recession of bricklayers and carpenters. It'd be a recession of government workers. I got a feeling I'd cut a bunch of them freeloaders off. Just like one man used to live next door to me. He said, we got a welfare problem. But he said, it ain't the poor people that's getting the welfare checks. Said, They're not the ones that gets most of the money. I think he said the, the, the recipients only get like 20 or 25%. He said, 75% of all of the money goes to run the bureaucracy of the, the headquarters of the thing that gives the checks out. Now, that's where I'd cut it out. And then the other day on television, you know, they got on one preacher. He was raising money for missions and feeding poor people. And 92% of everything he raised actually went to feed people. He took 8% to pay the salaries of his workers and his radio and television bills. And they was fussing at him about that. Can you imagine that? Honey, if you're a preacher, the devil's crowd going to talk about you. And anybody that comes against the truth is part of the devil's crowd. So what do we got? We've got a bunch of people that thought they had something they didn't have. You couldn't convince them that they didn't have it. They really thought they had it. You know, but look what mess and what havoc they're playing. Just reminded me the other day, we went somewhere on a trip and Jennifer stayed with some folks, and they got real religious lately. 
Her husband left her for some other woman, so she couldn't get him back, so she turned to religion. Now they're laying in the floor, talking in tongues, shaking, quaking, and jerking, and that's the substitute for the husband being there. He'd been gone six or eight months. We got a Christmas card for her yesterday. <laughs> Can you believe he'd been living with some other woman for eight months, and they had her name from Pete and Mary. I thought, Pete, he'd been gone eight months living over with some other woman. Pete ain't got nothing to do with sending this Christmas card to me. But I said they have become religious fanatics. Lunatic cases. Quiet in here now. But you couldn't convince them for one minute that they didn't have it. You couldn't convince them that they wasn't going back when Jesus comes in the rapture. Some folks don't get it. I talked to a little lady in my office the other day. And she was telling me about a church that she started going to. And I, I don't know, maybe Rose could tell me more, but she was a, you know her. So I, I, maybe she was a Baptist or something. I don't know what she was. She didn't know maybe nothing about Pentecost. That was the impression I got. And so she kind of came out of that and got around some Pentecost folks and she started going down to this church where this woman was the preacher. Maybe I ought not tell this, but she didn't seem to mind. But anyhow, she got her husband to go on. And the next thing you know, that woman was making a pass at her husband, but claiming to be Pentecostal. Quiet in here now, ain't it? Somebody said, who was that? Ain't none of your business who that was, but that really happened. <clears throat> but how many in church, all mixed up, all balled up, but we've got an idea. We open up the newspaper and they'll have a picture of a church or something and they'll say, go to the church of your choice this week. Well, you might choose the wrong one. I seen two of them riding by on bicycles a while ago. You want to go off with them? Why don't you study and see the history of that Mormon church? I don't mean to call names, but might as well tell it like it is. They up there with them big computers and they run your family tree and figure out who your grandma and your grandpa was and your great grandpa and they have baptismal services for them folks that's been dead for 200 years. That's the most ignorant claptrap I've ever heard of in all my life. But they're preying on people today and you couldn't convince them that they didn't have it. You couldn't convince them that when the rapture takes place that they're not going to make it. But somebody's going to be fooled. The Bible said so right here. Listen. So all these folks got up. When this got near this rapture, they all started getting ready for it. Praise God. I'm getting ready for it. Jesus is getting ready to come. They all got up. They trimmed their lamps. But somehow, when it got to the showdown, all of a sudden, some of them that thought they had it for the first time realized, wait a minute, I don't have what I thought I had. How many folks today have got an empty spot down in their heart? They feel like something's wrong, something's missing, and what they think, they, they think the problem is down in their church. Maybe it's the pastor ain't quite as spiritual as he should be. Or maybe it's some of the members. You know, I, I believe the problem's down to church, and the problem all the time is they don't have the Holy Ghost. And it's God trying to say there's an emptiness, there's a longing there, there's something that you need that you don't have, and they're putting it on to everybody else. It's the church, the preacher, it's this, it's Jim Baker, it's whoever. <laughs> they lay it on to anybody, but it's them that don't have it. But they think they got it. And they'll march in the streets over abortion, and they'll hoop and holler about this and that and the other, and think that they got it. But there's coming a showdown when some of these that don't have it, that thinks they do, will suddenly realize they don't, but that's the hour where the bridegroom comes. He said, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made. I believe that cry was nothing more than a prophet of God standing, giving his message. 
the prophet of God standing, giving the invitation to come to the marriage supper. You can't come unless you have the invitation. You can't attend there unless your name was wrote on the book before the foundation of the world. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Watch what happened. And all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us of your oil for our revelation won't work. The light that we have on this ain't working. That's what it means. Hello? We thought we had this rapture all figured out, but it ain't going the way we thought it was going. Everybody's got their ideas of the coming of the Lord. What they don't realize that before the literal rapture, there is an appearing of the Lord that takes place. Now watch this thing. Over, let me show you. The first bride failed. There was a beautiful place called the Garden of Eden. I'll be through here in a moment. Don't hang up on me. There was a place called the Garden of Eden. God put Adam in the garden. Then the next thing you know, God caused that deep sleep to come on him. Took out the rib. Took out all the female part. And made a woman, Eve. Now watch what God did. God came down and brought his word. I want you all to watch this. God came and preached the word. To put it simple, he was saying to him, you can eat of, see all these trees in this garden? He said, you can eat of all these trees, except there is a tree over here in the midst of the garden that don't you eat of it, don't you even touch it. The day you do, ye shall surely die. He came and brought his word and left. Oh yeah. He didn't stay down there. But then every evening in the cool of the evening, he'd come back to the garden. You ever read that? He'd leave. He brought the word and gave it and left. Then what happened, while he had brought it, and while he was gone, then the serpent slipped in and seduced this woman called Eve. He beguiled her during the time when he had left the garden. Now, so the first bride failed. And the point is at this, down here at the end of time that we're living in, my Bible begins to tell me about a scene in heaven in Revelation, the fourth and the fifth chapters. It tells me that there's one sitting on a throne with a book that's sealed on the backside of and so forth with seven seals. And the Bible tells me that John got up there and began to look at this scene in heaven and he found out that nobody in heaven and nobody in the earth and nobody beneath the earth was worthy to tell about the vision and the prophecy that Daniel said was sealed up. Daniel said it was sealed to the time of the end. And John said, I begin to weep. I wept much because John knew that in the pages of that book would show who was saved and who was lost. And unless somebody could come and rip off the seals and prove who had it, then everybody was going to be lost. Everybody was going to go to a devil's hell. How many is listening to me now? But brother, I want you to know, one of the elders said, Weep not, John, for the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed, and he'll loose the seals of the book. And John turned to see a lion, but he saw a lamb, and the lamb had blood on it. He saw Jesus that had died on the cross and shed his blood. How many is listening to me now? He saw Jesus and this lamb, this bloody lamb came to the throne and took the book out of the hand of God upon the throne and ripped off the seven seals and handed the book back. And the Bible said the one on the throne got up and came down to earth and the bloody lamb sat down upon the throne. God came down with that little book opened. And thank God, it tells us in Revelation 10 and 7 that when God came down, a prophet was standing here on the earth to begin to tell the people what the book said, what God said. He said it was in that hour that all the mysteries of God would be finished. But you know, He didn't do us like He did Eve. 
He came and he brought the word. And he didn't leave. He's staying with us. I said he's here now. He came down. Hallelujah. And the presence of the Lord is going on right now. I said he is here now. Somebody said he's always been here. I beg to differ with you. Honey, on the day of Pentecost, it was the Holy Ghost that came down. I'm not talking about the infilling of the Holy Ghost. That's it been here since the day of Pentecost. But I'm telling you that the great God that was sitting on the throne took that book that had had the seals ripped off, exposing the word of God, and God himself came down in Revelation chapter 10 and verse 1. He came, and he stayed with us so we don't fail. Eve failed. But he's going to have a group of people at the end time that will not fail. But we got a bunch of foolish virgins that don't even know what I'm talking about. I'd go down there and hear that, Brother Jim, but I hear him on the radio. I don't even know what that man's talking about. Well, honey, I got news for you. You're a lost ball in high weeds. I got news for you. You'll be here when they push the button and drop the bombs. I got news for you. You'll be here when the battle of Armageddon takes place. You're going to miss the rapture. You're going to miss all of these things. I'm going to tell you what. You're going to have to be kind of smart to make heaven. You're going to have to know something. God ain't taking a bunch of dumbbells in. Oh, you may never finish high school. I ain't talking that education. I ain't talking that kind of knowledge. But you're going to have to know something about God's Bible. You're going to have to have enough sense to know that you have received an invitation to attend the marriage supper of the Lamb. How did that work? You see, all of us have some friends probably that are rich and some that are poor and some that are black and some that are white and some that are Indian and some this, that, and the other. But in the olden days, when they had a wedding, what would they do? They'd send out invitations. And when you came, you had to have this invitation. So you'd come up to the door. Now, you may have been a beggar, kind of poor. Maybe you didn't have on very nice clothes. Guy behind you trying to get in the door, he may have been a wealthy man. Ring on his finger, nice suit of clothes. You came up and you presented your invitation. Now, this is the way they do it overseas. The man at the door looked at the invitation and said, yep, that's official invitation. And they took a robe and they put it around your shoulders, a wedding garment. Everybody that attended was dressed just alike. The next man may have been a wealthy man. <clears throat> they saw his invitation, put a robe around his shoulders, and they went in and they sat down to eat. And that's why the Bible tells the story of when the man came in that was putting this on, he looked. And everybody sitting at the table had on a wedding garment except one man. He said, friend, how did you get in here? You had to have an invitation. You had to have the tickets. You had to present that at the door. And if you'd have come in by the door, you would have received the wedding garment, but you've made it here. But you must have slipped in some other way because you didn't have the invitation. Do you see what I'm saying? And he was cast where? In outer darkness. That means the tribulation period. You will not make that rapture. You will not make the marriage supper of the Lamb unless you have the invitation to attend. And you have to have on the wedding garment. Lord, have mercy. Somebody slip up your hands and begin to praise and, and magnify God. Yes, sir. You have to have on this wedding garment. Now, the Bible talks about blessed are they that wash that garment. How do you do that in the Word? The Word of God. You see, when this man came down, when God came down, 
the things that have been sealed up since Daniel was to seal them, he had the book and it was opened. But it took a prophet standing there to tell you what was in that book that had been sealed. Now, some folks don't believe that. Some folks say, I'm going to follow my church. I'm going to follow my bishop. I'm going to follow my pastor. But God's doing something new today. We're not in that church age now. We've gone beyond that. How many is listening to me now? The Laodicean church age was the filthiest age of all. A part where they thought they were rich and increased with goods and had need of nothing. I'll have you to know I've spoken tongues. I've healed the sick. I've dreamed dreams. I've had visions. I've got the Holy Ghost. I don't, who, who are you to tell me what I need, honey? I got it. That's the way they do. They'll tell you in a heartbeat they got it. But, knowest it not that wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You think you've got on this wedding garment? <laughs> he said you're naked. You can't make this marriage supper of the Lamb without the wedding garment. And while they think they got it, they're naked. While they think they can see what the Word of God said, they're blind. They think they're rich and they're poor. No, sir, they don't have it. Why? It's changed. Everything has changed. Up until a few years ago, everybody thought they maybe knew the word. We were really just guessing because the book was sealed, but now the book's come open and we can see plainly what it says. Not to guess anymore. God said he was going to send a prophet. That prophet would be standing on the earth when the Lord comes down with the book open. The prophet tells everybody what all the secrets are. And those secrets you got to know to get into the kingdom. Everybody thinks it's some experience shaking and quaking and electricity running up and down your backbone. That ain't it at all. It's what you know. The Bible said be transformed by a renewing of your mind. What does your mind do? It thinks thoughts. Is that right? So a lot of folks think they got it because they can scream, dance, jump, shout, holler. Ain't none of that got nothing to do with what I'm talking about. You can dance, you can shout, you can scream, holler, cry, jump. Throw your baby one way and fall over backwards in the seat the other way. And that don't show you got nothing except... Missing a little on the brain there, you know, for throwing your baby. Amen. Amen. No, he said, be transformed by renewing. My mama and my grandmama before her was a member of this church. That ain't got nothing to do with it. You've got to be transformed by renewing of your mind. What your mama had won't work for you. Your mama might have made it in on what she believed. But it won't work for you. Some of them might have made it in through ignorance. Hello? There was a time when God winked at ignorance. How many knows that? And some of you go down and you got baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And that's a false baptism. And God might have winked at your ignorance because you just didn't know no better. But honey, there's no excuse today. It ain't going to work. Your mama might have got in and your grandmama before her and not exactly, they, they believed all they knew to believe. You see, the covers hadn't come open to, on the book yet. How many understand? They might have got in and you might believe the same thing, but it ain't going to let you in. Why? Because something has happened. Something has changed. God came down with the open book. And he proved to us that it ain't Father, Son, and Holy Ghost baptism, but it's Lord Jesus Christ. Your mama might have got in paying her dues, and she didn't know no better, bless her heart. But today, honey, we've turned the corner. It's the dawn of a new day. God's come down and ripped the seals off, and the book is open, and there's now no excuse for sin. God's not winking at ignorance anymore. So it's not what you feel, but it's what you know, what you believe. It 
does make a difference what you believe. Preach on, preacher. So we're going to this marriage supper, but you got to have the invitation. You got to know you're invited. Hello? You can't just show up and no, you got to know that you're invited. And I believe this. I believe you got to know your names on the book. Somebody said, we ain't going to know. You know, we used to sing that old song, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. And we preach that. You know how, how we get up there and they'll say, Edgar West. Edgar come up there and he's standing there shaking in his knees, knocking, oh, am I going to make it as my name on the book? Nah. Honey, I want you to know it's down here on this earth that you come to this knowledge of the truth. It's here that you find out your name is on the book. How do you know it's on there? Because you begin to believe the revelation of the last day. That proves your name's on there. Can't nobody believe this except those that God's called. And what's happening is scene going on in heaven, a court trial. How many times I've preached it? I'll preach it till some of you understand it. You stand up and make a profession of faith Say, praise God, I'm saved, and God's forgive me my sins, and I'm a part of the bread, and I believe something goes on in heaven right then. I believe the devil steps up. He's the accuser of the brethren. The devil steps up and said, hold it. Edgar West stood up and said he had it, and I don't believe his name's on the book, but I want you to know we've got a defense attorney. We've got one who's like a bloody lamb. He's worthy enough to do this because he died and shed his blood for us. And that one standing there with blood all over him, that lamb steps forth and takes the book and opens it up and proves to the devil that our name is on that book. And that settles it. If your name ain't on that book, it won't come like Jimmy Swaggart sings. There's a new name written down in glory and it's mine. Honey, there's no scripture anywhere in this Bible that tells you new names are being written on this book. It's not so. Every name that's on there was wrote there before the foundation of the world. And nobody can blot a name off of the Lamb's book of life that God put on there. Quiet now. I said, God put them on, and man can't take them off. They might kick you out of the church. They might disfellowship you. But listen, can't nobody take your name off God's book if God put it on there. And if it wasn't on there then, it'll never be on there now. Ain't nothing you can do to get it put on there. See, the Bible said God added daily to the church such as should be saved. He knows whose name's on the book. Whew. Quiet in here now. So the devil steps forth say, I object. He got up and said he's got it, and I don't believe his name's on the book. They have a trial right then. And God said, there's his name. I wrote it there. I keep my word. I wrote the name before the foundation of the world, and it's on the book. And that settles it. And if you don't ever come to the point where you find your name on the book, then how are you going to know you've been invited to the wedding? How do you know you got an invitation? How do you know these things? Because when the prophet comes and begins to preach, you say, amen, that's so. That sounds right. I believe it. That's God's word. You begin to see it in every place in the Bible. And you know you've been invited. You know you're a part of it. So we've got a marriage supper. I preached this last week. We're taken to heaven someday in this rapture. It's just the bride that goes, not the church. Not the church members, but the bride, the chosen ones, are taken in the rapture. We receive rewards and blessings and we have the marriage supper. And then later on over here, we come back. How many ever read that part? Yeah, we come back. Let me read it. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. This is Revelation, the 19th chapter, by the way, 11th verse. 
And his eyes were as a flame of fire. Sound like the same one we've run into before, doesn't it? And on his heads were many crowns. He didn't have crowns back there in chapter 5. Where did he get them? The Bible said the saints would crown him king of kings and lord of lords. On his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Listen now. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And here we are. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That's us. That's you and me coming back for the battle of Armageddon. There's a great battle. And millions of people die. It takes months to bury them and so forth. You've read the story. Satan gets bound for a thousand years. Listen, we are going to have a honeymoon on this earth and we're not going to have to contend with the devil. He's bound for a thousand years. <clears throat> now listen. Peter spoke of it. He said the heavens and the earth would pass away with a great noise. The elements would melt with a fervent heat. John wrote about it and he said, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God, and God shall wipe all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. All right. So the new heavens and new earth, the former is passed away. To be passed away does not mean to go out of existence. But it literally means it's changed. So the earth will be renovated by fire. Volcanoes will erupt. Fire everywhere. How long will it take to all this to happen? All, all these volcanoes erupting and fire into the atmosphere. I don't know. All germs and everything will be destroyed. Every sign of sin and corruption will be destroyed. How many is listening now? It's going to be a wonderful time, isn't it? Satan bound. Devil's crowd ain't here. One day that earth will cool off <clears throat> and we're going to come back and have our honeymoon here with him. Now, that's going to be a wonderful thing. Also, during that time is when we're going to anoint the most holy. Let's just read a little bit. When the tabernacle is erected, the resurrection has come, the Jews has returned, Christ and his bride has come. The Jew, the 144,000 are sealed. The millennium has taken place. There will be an anointing when the most holy place will be anointed. The holiest of holies, the most holy. The most holy place is a sanctuary where God lived between the cherubim. And this time Christ will set up the most holy place with the anointing upon him. And they'll need no sun there, for the Lamb in the midst of the city shall be the light, and the sun shall never go down in that city. It never will, because Christ will be that light, the anointed one. And the king will come and take his throne for 1,000 years to reign. Let's read a little portion over here in Jeremiah 3 and 12. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, thou backslidden Israel, saith the Lord, that I will not cause my anger to fall upon you. For I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God and hast scattered thy ways to the stranger under evergreen tree. Now, how many knows that's what Israel has done? 
See, they sinned, they transgressed, and they've been scattered in every nation under the heavens. Is that right? And you have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Turn, O backslidden children, saith the Lord, for I am married to you. Now, you see, the Jews were blinded to give the Gentiles a chance, but he said, I'm married to you. And I will take you one of a city and two of a family. Now, it's not all that calls themselves Jews that are going, but it's an elected group that goes in. The little representative of little Benjamin, remember David? I mean, her, uh, <clears throat> the one with the coat of many colors and all that. Remember little Benjamin, his brother? How they come down before Joseph. That's who I was trying to think of. That group out of every nation, out of every city, and out of every family. And he said, and I will bring you to Zion. And I will give you a pastor according to thine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And it shall come to pass when you be multiplied and increased in the land. What do you think is happening over there now? They're looking for something like four million people from Russia. Israel been a little nation, but it soon be, I think, seven million. It's increasing in the land. What did they have in the paper this week? A picture of house trailers built in North Carolina being loaded on boats in Moorhead City or Wilmington, what were they doing? They were shipping them to Tel Aviv, Israel, and they're going to house many of those people coming from Russia that they don't have houses for. So God said they would be uh, multiplied and increased in the land. In those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more. <clears throat> the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither <clears throat> shall it be done anymore. And at that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. Why? Because, see, he'll be there. And all nations shall gather unto it in the name of the Lord to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after their own imaginations of their evil, of, in the evil of their heart. Now, that's when the city's to be anointed. That's when New Jerusalem be anointed. And all nations, see, Revelation 22nd chapter, see, it said that the gates would not be closed by night because there'll be no night there. And the kings of the earth shall bring their honor and glory into this city. Its walls will be jasper and sardis stone, twelve manner of stones, and twelve gates <clears throat> shall be one solid pearl, one each gate. There'll be no need of a candle there. There won't be no more sunlight, for the Lamb that's in the midst of the city shall be the light, and he shall lead his people into everlasting life. And there'll be two trees, one on either side of the river, and they <clears throat> for the healing of the nation. That's that anointed one that will come, the holy city descending from God out of heaven, coming to the earth. Now, let's go over here to Isaiah, the 65th chapter in the 17th verse. It said, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. The former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. But be glad and rejoice even in that which I create, for I create Jerusalem <clears throat> a joy and, a, and her people a joy. What is an anointing? It's the joy, see, of the Lord. Create Jerusalem a joy and her people a joy, and I will rejoice in Jerusalem. Now the king and the throne of the royal majesty of the throne, the eternal throne, the eternal people with an eternal joy in an eternal city. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and my joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be heard no more <clears throat> in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence, infant of days, Listen to all this now. Nor an old man that has not fulfilled his day, for the child shall die a hundred years old, but a sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. And they shall build houses. Here's the part I like. Now, we're talking the honeymoon of the bride now. It's talking of us and that we will build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and they shall eat the fruit of them. They shall build they shall not build and another inhabit. In other words, you die and your son take your place. So they shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat thereof. For as the days of a tree shall be the days of my people, and mine elect shall, <clears throat> they shall enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bring forth for trouble. For they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offsprings with them. And it shall come to pass before they call, I will answer. And while they're yet speaking, I will hear. 
The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like a bullock, and the dust shall be the serpent's meat, and they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. Isn't that precious? What are we going to do? We're going to have a time after this earth is renovated, not destroyed, but renovated, burned over. We're going to come and going to build houses and plant vineyards and plant fruit trees, and we will live and enjoy all of that, and it's going to be a peaceful thing. It'll be a whole new civilization. Won't have to worry about automobiles and all of the things like we have now. Won't have none of that in that new civilization. Isaiah 11 and 9, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, a branch that shall grow up out of his root. Who's that? That's Christ out of his root. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom, of understanding, the spirit of counsel, <clears throat> might, the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. And he shall make him of quick understanding and the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove their iniquity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. The righteous shall be girded of the lion, and the faithful the gird of his reins. And the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall die, lie down with the kid, that's the goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall feed their young ones and shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. And the suckling child shall play upon the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the cockatrice den. And thou shalt not hurt or destroy in all the holy mountains, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge as the water covers the sea. Isn't this going to be a great time? Well, there won't be nothing. I was writing a little letter that the Lord put on my heart about a little place. You know, I hate snakes. They'll hurt you. They can kill you. I didn't know that too much when I was a kid. Oh, I knew, you know, if you got bit, you had to get treated. And, and if you didn't get bit, I knew you could die. They, that's what's a treacherous thing. We won't have to worry about that in this new place. Some of you wonder... Brother Jim like to go to some of these islands. Why do you go there, Brother Jim? They don't have no snakes in some of them places. I can go to the jungles down in Jamaica, and there ain't no snakes. No, a preacher almost 80, 90 years old, he said he saw one snake in his life, and that was when he was a kid, and they had brought in uh, mongooses. And those mongoose had, and this happened in St. Martin and other places, they had such a snake problem. They bring in the mongoose, and the mongoose would kill all the snakes, and now there's no snakes to kill, so they're killing chickens and dogs and things. They got to have something to eat. <clears throat> but I, I love those islands. Don't have to worry about it. I went to the Bahamas. They got one snake, and he's not poisonous. So I like that. Well, I'm sure going to like this new earth. We'll have to worry about no snakes. We'll have to worry about no lions. We'll have to worry about the bear getting you. Right, walk in the woods, and we won't have to we'll have no problems. Isn't that going to be good? Now, after this, the bride appears. After the 70 weeks, the bride appears in Revelation, the 19th chapter, in the 1st and 16th verse. She arrives with her bridegroom, the mighty king. Now, we have already read that part where that uh, we came down. How many is enjoying this so far? Ain't we having a good time here? Let's see. Uh, if I can find where this is, the 19th chapter. Oh, I'm in the wrong. Let's see what we got here now. Listen to this. Revelation 19, 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia. Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants upon her hand. 
And again they said hallelujah, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters. Now, who's that? That's many preachers, see. And the voice of a mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. What you do to get ready? You come here and you hear some preaching. You had to do something. You had to come here, right? You heard some preaching. We had fellowship together. There's something you got to do, see. You have to make sacrifice. You know, I don't know that going down there every week. That's a long ways to go. And gas prices is going up. Well, the bride has got to make herself ready. It pays you to be here every Sunday if you want to make what I'm talking about. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he <clears throat> saith unto me, Write. Blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper. I better say that again. How do you get to this marriage supper? You run down there and you pray and you, you, you join the church. No, he said, blessed are they that are called. Something has got to come and call you to the marriage supper. Is that right? Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. And then this last verse, and I fell at his feet to worship him. That was John saying this. To worship who? Let's find out. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. John was so overcome by seeing all of this when he was commanded to write all of this how did he get it? There was an angel. What is an angel now? It's, it's a prophet, a messenger. Is that right? See, it, it, it happened to John again. Watch this. Over here, he just got so overcome again in Revelation 22 and 8. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel that showed me these things. Now, some of you think that's some angel with wings. Just hold on. Some of you don't get it when, when you read the Bible about an angel. See, what are you listening to? You're listening to some of that Catholic theology of all them angels and them artists that painted them pictures, these angels and all these wings and all this, that, and the other. Now, just hang loose. Watch what he said here. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not. For I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren, the prophets. Do you see this man said, I am a prophet, but the Bible called him an angel. And some folks think there's something in heaven. No, this is on earth. That's what I've been trying to preach all along. The Bible, when it said there were seven angels to the seven churches, it wasn't talking about Gabriel or Michael, which is a heavenly being. But it was talking about seven prophets or seven preachers to the seven churches. Just men, see. He said, I'm thy fellow servant and of the brethren the prophets and of them which keep the sayings of this book. He said, worship God. Boy, if we don't get nothing else today, I hope we get that part. See? <clears throat> so isn't that good? Now, all right, we've studied the rest of that where he came back in that, that great time. So we've done just about all that we can do on this thing here in the 24th verse in Daniel 9. How many of you enjoying this? Don't you see that there is some great things that's just ahead for the people of God? But think about the terrible things that are still left for those that don't know God. Now what do we need to do? We need to wash our clothing. 
How are you going to do that, preacher? You need to get in. You need to have this experience with God. You Wash it in the water of separation, the Word. I hope you're following me now. It takes more than just coming here and hearing me preach. You've got to believe this thing. But do you see now? You see there's something that's got to be preached today, and this is what these people are missing. They're trying to get you to get an experience of some kind. Get down here and pray till you talk in tongues. See, it's always some kind of a get down here and pray until you feel like your sins are gone. Oh, I know my sins are gone. The load been lifted. See, it's always an experience. Did you feel it? He never did ask folks that. He said, do you believe it? So that's the main thing. And this is what folks don't realize. They're always either trying to join something or feel something. But it really boils down to the fact that Daniel was commanded to seal up this book. And because it's sealed, we never would understand but so much of it. And some of the understanding we would have would be wrong. Is that right? But finally, he said at the end time, it would be opened up and we would understand everything we needed to know about this book. And when it gets opened, how dare you to try to seal it up again. In other words, if I had a secret and I told that secret, you can't untell it. It's been told. It's not a secret anymore. So that's what he's saying over here. Listen to this thing, see? <clears throat> he's talking about this book. You can't seal the thing back anymore. It's in Revelation the 22nd chapter and verse 10, he said unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book for the times at hand. So Daniel said it was sealed up, but then it comes unsealed. The Lord Jesus comes up and rips the seals off. He was worthy to do it. Why? Because he died and shed his blood. He unseals it, hands it back to the one on the throne and that one comes down and a prophet standing here to tell us what's in the book. And you can't seal it back up no more. Some folks would like to because some folks don't like this kind of religion. A lot of folks like a religion where they got to do something. They, oh, they're workers. They're like an old mule. Just work all day long. Work, 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 work. Look what I've done. I'm good. I treat everybody right. I've done this. I've paid my tithes. I've paid my dues. I, 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 I. They like that kind of religion where it's something they feel like they 